I am so grateful for the privilege of being here today and, and also to our faculty here, to all of the students, and especially to uh, Dr. Akins. I am so uh, honored. It's just a privilege uh, to be able to hear and thank you for the, the invite. I am so unworthy. And so, again, I am grateful. I'm grateful for this man's heart and uh, the years I've known him. He's not only always been about uh, the Word of God and making sure students and people are prepared. He's, he's always had a heart for evangelism and missions. And I've seen over the years his heart for diversity. And uh, I don't really know many people, uh, Dr. Aikens, like yourself, who has a heart that huge for diversity. And I think it shows here uh, on this campus. Let's give Dr. Aikens a great big hand and the fine work that God is doing through him. Amen. We talk about diversity. Man, I was so glad to get the, uh, the memo from Amy that we could wear jeans. And so I figured I had them on yesterday. I wear the same ones today. And I uh, figured we got a diverse audience. And so uh, this is what I call my diversity outfit. So I got my jeans on for the younger guys, sport jacket on for my old guys like me. I got on this, I don't know, kids wearing these kind of shirts. They're like a picnic tablecloth to me. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I threw that silk hanky in there for all the black brothers, you know what I mean? It's like, that's diversity. <laughs> so y'all know where I'm coming from. <laughs> oh, man. Now, how many of you all, this is the first time we've met? Raise your hand. First time? Oh, wow. That's a lot of y'all. All right, invite me over for dinner. We get acquainted. And don't worry about people say when a guest speaker gets up and people don't know, they spend the first 10 minutes trying to figure him out. Don't, we ain't got time for that, all right? I don't even know myself. Reminds me of a story of Big Telly Evangelist. And, you know, he's just arrogant, prideful, and he went to this uh, rehab center for Alzheimer's patients uh, to visit one of the members. And when he walked in, uh, he saw the lady and uh, he kept talking to her and she realized that this woman didn't know who I am. I mean, like, really didn't know who I am. I'm a big televangelist. So he said to her, he says, ma'am, he says, do you know who I am? She says, no, I don't, baby. But if you stop by the front desk, they'll tell you. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. <laughs> so we're going to skip all of that. Amen. Get right down to the word of God. Y'all praying for me this morning? Amen. <laughs> I don't want to be like uh, this large company and they're having a lot of problems and uh, they hired this CEO young guy to go in and kind of straighten out the problems and he went into one of the factories and uh, he just decided, you know, he's going to make an example out of somebody. And so he saw this guy just standing there and he said to this guy, he says, hey, come here. He said, let me, let me say something to you. You're just standing around loafing around, goofing around, just spending company money. And he says, how much money do you make a week anyway? The guy says, about $300 a week. He says, look, he reached in his pocket and pulled out $1,200. He said, here's four weeks paid. Now get out of here, you lazy scoundrel. He asked one of the guys with him, what does that guy do anyway? He said, he's the Domino's pizza delivery guy. So I don't, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> come up here and do the wrong thing, say the thing, wrong thing, and make a costly mistake. I, I really want to talk about a serious matter. I know not only in chapel service, but in your studies, you talk about a lot of things. But I really want to talk about a message from the heart. Several years ago, Chicago Cubs relief pitcher Bob Patterson described one of the pitches with which the Cincinnati Reds Barry Larkins hit for a game-winning home run. He described it this way. He said it was a cross between a screwball and a change-up. He called it a screw-up. Live long enough, and you'll have those pitches in your life. You'll either throw one, or you'll be on the receiving end, the batting end, trying to figure out what to do with it. The reality is we're all taught at a very young age the importance of winning and being successful. From the days of kindergarten, <clears throat> we're taught much about success and actually very little about how to cope with failure. But we never want our children to even consider the idea of failing because failure is a premier sign in our culture and society of weakness. We live in a competitive society that places much emphasis on winners and shun the idea of being a loser. 
educators, motivational speakers, life coaches, sports psychologists, and other gurus mainly teach us on how to approach success and how to be winners. Few teach us an even more valuable lesson in how to cope with failure. A society that actually worship winners tend often to make terrible choices, whether considered from a moral or even a practical perspective. Consider the widespread practice of preferring job applicants with a near-perfect GPA over those with, I'll say it to you know, compliment some of you all, mo more diverse scores. <laughs> the conventional view is that someone with a near-perfect grade point average will become a near-perfect employee. Yet there's a conspicuous flaw in this reasoning. So let us understand what we're really saying with this reasoning. What we're really insinuating is that a straight-A student will become a straight-A employee and possibly a straight-A citizen. Let's get this straight. A straight-A student is not a perfect person, but someone who has never done badly in a course. But this may also mean more often that they have not really been tested. If they have not been tested to the extent of receiving at least some weak grades in their life, then they miss out on the opportunity of learning how to cope with failure. Let me pause here because I am not suggesting in any way that we should fail, that we should be slackers. But failure will happen in our lives. Whether it's our own personal decision or the circumstances and situations surrounding us, you will not, students, succeed in everything you do. An athletic team that has a perfect uh, regular season record. You know the story. They wind up going to the championship game and losing against a team oftentimes with a mediocre record. One of the reasons why is because sports psychologist says teams that have lost during the season know how to cope and know how to rebound when they down. They come back underdogs. Seattle Seahawks. Go Hawks. Thought I would throw that in there and make you mad. An untested employee is really like an untried soldier. They're liable to break down under fire from real-world difficulties and challenges. Even if they do fall apart emotionally, they tend to be rigid, narcissistic, and even uncreative. And although it might seem obstinate to claim that prior failure is an advantage for a job candidate, contrary to the received conventional wisdom of personal recruiters, experiencing failure is actually the best qualification for anyone applying for a difficult situation. Ministry is difficult. God never wastes an experience. And whether it's your high day or your lowest season, God wants to use that to build you up. I want to talk to you this morning about finding fruit in your failure. Finding fruit in your failure. So what are the advantages of experiencing failure? People who fail repeatedly develop persistence in the face of difficulties. Only people with extensive histories of failure could survive the difficulties that other individuals cannot endure. With success, people have a habit of doing the same things the same way over and over again. But psychologists tell us that when they fail, they're forced to adapt and to change. That is not just human characteristic, but it constitutes a basic, basic feature in how the human brain works. If lab rats no longer get rewarded for pressing a lever that used to yield food and pellets, they get visibly upset and they start jumping around and doing all kinds of things and clawing, trying to figure out other ways how to be creative in order to survive. When one combines emotional originality, there's a fair close, uh, fairly close as to what we think is artistic creativity. People seem to exceed. Artists, for instance, aren't necessarily frustrated people, but they tend to be dissatisfied with what they did yesterday and they want to accomplish new goals and new things. Never underestimate the, the mystical properties of failure. It rewinds the brain, and if we would submit our hearts and soul to the Lord, God can build us up to be successful. What I'm trying to say this morning is that, that failure is not all bad. We need to search for fruit 
in our failure. I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and we have a very familiar story. And such is the case for a man that we witness in the Word of God today that has been paralyzed for over 38 years, and by societal standards, now even by his own assessment of himself, he was considered a failure. This ambiguous, crippled man has settled for a life of lameness, not only because of his physical condition, but because of his many years of attempting to be healed and his much striving in all of his planning and even in his former moments of desperation, he has failed at standing, walking, and having stability. He's failed in being a contributor to society. He's a failure. As we turn and we look at this biblical account, I want you to know that all of us have and all of us will fail at some things in life. We all have situational, we all have circumstantial failures. We all have, at some, we'll have at some point either financial failures, relational failures, academic failures, moral failures, goal failures. If we dig, dig way down into our failure portfolio, we can't get by this. All of us are spiritual failures. For the Word of God declares in Romans 3 and 23, you know, your Bible students, for all have sinned and failed. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we use this picture in, of a man here who has failed. John 5 verse 1 starts off, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Isn't it ironic? that the Lamb of God is standing at the sheep gate? Isn't it interesting that a well of living water is standing there at a pool for healing? In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, and John says they're all waiting for something, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already had that condition a long time. And he said to him, listen to this question, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool and whenever the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. John would have us to know, and that was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who he was. For Jesus had withdrawn in a multitude being in that place. When we go back and look at the text, only two things I really want to share with you out of this that I think is of great importance. We'll try to bring out some sub points that may help you even now as you experience whether you want to call it a lack of success a speed bump a challenge or maybe failure in your life let's first of all look at the conditions for failure the circumstances the text says in verse 3 there lay a great multitude of sick people blind lame paralyzed waiting they're waiting for something when we consider the conditions for failure, we understand that we all have a proclivity. We have a predisposition to failure simply because of original sin and simply because of na the, uh, the, uh, the nature of sin that resides in all of us. We have all fallen. We've all experienced some external, external exhibitions of failure as a result of an internal disposition that is constantly working in our lives against a righteous, perfect nature that God has placed inside of in his sanctifying work. Like those lying by the pool, we too suffer from the same, these same conditions. 
The text says that lying by the pool, there are sick people. All of us are sinfully sick. Never get beyond that fact of what we're capable of doing, not what we're doing, but the propensity and the capability we have to possibly sin. All of us are sick. There are those that are lying by the pool that are blind. All of us have been blinded by this world. We have been blinded by Satan. We have been blinded by sin to the things of God, to the love of God, to the kingdom of God, to the truths of God. And like those lying by the pool, all of us are lame and paralyzed. We can't stand erect. We can't walk for God. We can't walk in righteousness without his grace. I'm speaking today to not only those of you that are students, but when you leave this seminary, when you leave this college, you got to understand the people that God has called you to minister to every single day. They're in this condition and they come to church on Sunday mornings or they never come to church and they're not churched at all. And they're waiting for something. They're waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for a change. They're waiting for you. Those who realize that all have sinned and all have failed. And those who have recovered by the grace of God and have a testimony to share with others. We don't live in a perfect world with perfect people. We live in a fallen world with imperfect people under imperfect conditions. But until we change oftentimes the environment that we're in, until we start changing some of the habits, until we sometimes start making changes in our lives, listen, we'll continue to do the same things to fall into the same traps over and over and over again. I'm going to say it again. I'm not suggesting failure. I'm coming to the realization that all fail. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? We can't stay in that place. We can't be like this man and just, just get satisfied in being in the condition that we're in. If you're not an honor student, if you're getting terrible grades, the question is, what are you going to do about it? If you set out in ministry and some of your ministry goals don't reach fruition, then what are you going to do about it? If you've got character flaws, what are you going to do about it? There were two hunters, they were out hunting, that came upon what appeared to be abandoned, an abandoned farm. And the only thing that they noticed about this farm that had any life at all, there were some chickens running around, there was this abandoned barn, and, and they saw this goat there. And, uh, and so they, you know, said, well, maybe we can hunt on this land. And one of the farmer, one of the hunters got curious. He looked over at this well and looked down the well. He says, man, that well sure is deep. I wonder just how deep it is. The other guy says, man, we can throw something over in there and kind of time it, listen to the splash. We can tell how deep it is. They looked around, they didn't see anything, looking for a rock or some heavy obstacle. They saw this transmission from an old car sitting out there. They struggled to pick it up and they threw it over in the well. When they threw it over in the well, they turned around from the well and this goat just come charging straight at them. They jumped out the way, the goat just goes right down the hole in the well. It says, man, that goat is crazy. Next thing you know, the farmer who owns the property comes walking up and says, how are you boys doing? He said, just fine. Want to know if we can hunt on your property? He says, sure, just be careful. Say, any of you guys seen my goat out here? He says, man, you got a crazy goat. We're standing at the well. He just comes charging at us, just jump right over in the well. And he says, really? He says, last time I remember, I tied him up to an old transmission out here. <laughs> the moral of that story is you follow whatever you're tied to. If we're tied to people that are not conducive, for the glory of God, if we're tired, tied to habit and ideas and entertainment that is not conducive for the glory of God, if we're tired to uh, a work ethic that is not productive to be a successful student, we'll fall down that same well because we'll follow whatever it is and whoever it is and whatever ideas that we're tied to. But notice how this man found a place of comfort in his crisis. When we go back and read verses 6 and 7, uh, Jesus asked the question, sir, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? <laughs> it seems like an obvious answer, almost a rhetorical question. Do you really want to be made well? In counseling, I ask that question all the time. Do you want your marriage to be healed? Do you, do you want to overcome this depression? Do you want to overcome this addiction? 
Do you want to have financial stability and become a wise steward? And you would think the answer would be obvious, absolutely yes. But as you sit there and you listen to how many excuses people make, like this man, he made an excuse to justify his condition. He had self-pity. It was Helen uh, Keller who said, self-pity is our worst enemy, and if we yield to it, we can never do anything wise in this world. Self-pity will bring us down and we start making excuses. Every time I try to get to the water, somebody cuts me off. It's always someone, someone else's problem. And I understand that in this room, everybody didn't grow up in Christian homes. And some of us, we grew up with parents in an environment that said that we were Christians, but it wasn't clearly demonstrated. We come from backgrounds that are never, not only diverse, but often adverse as well. People have abandoned us. People have walked out on us. They've left us lame. But we can't go back what happened 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago and keep pointing our finger of blame at that school teacher who said we'll never be anything. And now because we've got some bad grades, we think, well, maybe the school teacher was right. Maybe I'll never be anything. You can't go back and look at your prison record. And say, just because of what I did back then, it's going to always haunt me and I can never do anything to glorify God and make an impact on the world around me. It's self-pity. You got to get rid of it. It became everyone else's problem. And he started making all kinds of excuses instead of trying to find fruit in his failure. Thomas Edison is remembered for the incandescent light bulb among many other key inventions of the age of electricity, and he is said, he is said to have failed with a thousand different filaments before hitting on one material that actually worked for the incandescent light bulb. But Thomas Edison didn't consider it a failure. Thomas Edison said, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. You've got to recover. <laughs> failure oftentimes is a necessity in order for us to strive, to persevere, and ultimately to turn our hearts towards God. There are times when God leads us to loftier heights, and then there are other times that he might lead us to the low valleys. Understand also that this man didn't know who Jesus was. I hope you do. When the Pharisees, religious leaders, leaders said, who is it that healed you? He said, I don't know. But you do. You know the, sense, the, the source of your strength and your salvation. And the question is whether or not we're going to trust him. There is a cure for failure. And that ultimate, ultimate cure for failure is Jesus Christ. Notice that's where it starts and that's where it ends. The text starts off by saying, and Jesus saw him lying there. And Jesus knew how long he had been there. And Jesus knew his condition. God knows. God knows even when we can't figure it out. He knows. He sees you for who you are, and he accepts you for who you are. He loves you for who you are, but he loves you so much that he refuses to leave you where you are. It doesn't catch him by surprise. He knew before this world was ever framed. Our high points and our lows, our strengths and our weaknesses, our success and our failure. He knew this man's condition. He knows your condition. It's because he's not only an all-knowing God, but he's a sovereign and providential God as well. <laughs> Have you ever considered that sometimes God sets us up for failure? We don't like to hear it that way. In the public's eyes, Jesus was the biggest failure of all time. Yes, Peter failed, Moses failed, Abraham and Sarah, they failed. Rahab was a failure, look how God used them. But the Messiah, the Christos, he died a state of execution, a criminal's death. The world deemed him a failure, so much so that even his own disciples, they walked away. But look at God at work. Paul said it this way, that the Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh to buffet me, to bring me down to nothing, render me hopeless and helpless, without strength. But he said it was in that 
And Satan, the messenger of God, I always get that word confused, buffeting me. It's not buffet, is it? It's buffeting me. I always have food on the brain. But he said it was in that I realized how weak I was, but how strong God really is and how sufficient he is. <laughs> I was in the gym. Yeah, I go there every now and then. I was in the gym <clears throat> and um, personal trainer was working with a client and the client said, I overheard him say, well, what are we working on today? And said, uh, today we're working on failure. Failure. So the guy said, what do you mean by that? Total exhaustion. My goal today is to exhaust your muscles to a point of failure. He said, you won't be able to walk out of this gym. Your heart will feel like it's going to just explode. I would have got a refund right then, a rapid <laughs> refund. I said, I'm going on the other side of the gym. And people, they live over here. We might be fat, but we live. <clears throat> And you know, you Google everything. So I looked at muscle failure. It's not until muscles completely fail that they have the opportunity to rebuild and gain greater strength, replenish the blood cells, and get more life into it. It's not until the heart is exhausted. I got friends of mine that run marathons and, and all that kind of stuff. I, it's like they always try to talk me into running. I'm like, if you see me running, you better run with me because something really big is after me. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes God brings us to that place of total exhaustion, failure, so we can realize just how big and how strong he really is, how loving and how gracious he really is, and embrace his strength and embrace his grace. And we get stronger so that we can help other people as well. We got to learn how to trust and obey the word of God. Because I'm telling you, when we get in our, our difficult, difficult times, we sometimes do crazy things. We, we make bad decisions. It's the word of God that we have to trust. Max Licato in his book entitled, You'll Get Through This, said, Turbulent times will tempt you to forget God. Shortcuts will lure you. Sirens will call you. But don't be foolish or naive. Do what pleases God, nothing more and nothing less. In your moment of crisis, don't try to take matters into your own hand. Steve Tran of Westminster, California, closed his door after activating 25 bug bombs in his apartment, 25, trying to get rid of a cockroach problem that he had in his apartment. 25, set them off, closed the door, and blew up his apartment. And the reason why is because the gases from the bug bomb ignited with the pilot light in the oven. When he went inside over $10,000 worth of damage that was done, he looked at the back of the canister and he said only two was needed. It's good to follow directions, church. Sometimes in our frustration, even in our anger, we make terrible decisions. Someone said anger is one letter short of danger. And don't blow the screen door off your, your house or your heart or your mind because cockroaches seem to irritate you. It's a part of life. Stick with the direction. Stick with the word of God. Stick with the promises of God. Don't be afraid to take risk. Jesus presented a challenge to this man. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Whether he had never walked in his life or we do know this is nearly four decades he had not walked. And telling a man who hadn't walked in 38 years to stand up and walk, that's a huge risk to take. Don't stop taking risks because you didn't succeed in something else. Keep trying and keep working at it. One of the greatest blessings and potential in bearing fruit and finding fruit in our failure is this opportunity to take risks. For every closed door of opposition, God always opens up doors of opportunity. But we got to be willing to take the risks. People that are so hung up on success and are deemed successful, they're more concerned about hanging on to their success than they are about taking risks. For instance, a straight-A student 
They'll get to a certain point. If you're an undergrad, you get to your junior, senior year or, or wherever it might be, you're not going to sign up for any difficult courses because it'll become too challenging. You're afraid to take the risk of messing up perfection. But people like me, average students, we'll take a hard course because I know what it's like to struggle anyway. We'll take a difficult challenge. Don't be afraid of difficulties. Take the risk. John Ortberg states this in, his, in one of his writings. He says, the decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. This means that to be a follower of Jesus, you must renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. And that's sobering news for most of us, he says, because we're into comfort. But water walkers, I like that. Water walkers master failure. Did Peter fail? Ortberg asked. Failure is not an event, he says, but rather a judgment about an event. Failure is not something that happens to us or a label we attach to things. It's a way that we think about outcomes. Did Peter fail? He asked the question. Well, I suppose in a way he did. His faith wasn't strong enough. His doubts were stronger. He saw the winds. He took his eyes off of where they should have been. He sank. He fell. But here is what I think, Ortberg says. I think there were 11 bigger failures sitting in the boat. They failed quietly. They failed privately. Their failure went unnoticed, unobserved, uncriticized. Only Peter knew the shame of public failure. But only Peter knew two other things as well, he says. Only Peter knew, uh, uh, only Peter knew the glory of walking on water. He alone knew what it was to attempt to do what he was not capable of doing on his own. And then feeling the euphoria of being empowered by God to actually do it. Or Burke says, once you walk on water, you never forget it, not for the rest of your life. Man, take the challenge. Sign up, man. Go on the mission field. Become a translator with Wycliffe. Take the challenge. I don't know where I'm going to get $4,000 for to go to Oxford. Take the challenge. Just start praying and trusting God. Take the challenge. Well, I got an opportunity over here to serve in the volunteer. Take the challenge. Go to the Boys and Girls Club. Step outside of your comfort zone. Go down in the hood. It's amazing we want to get on a plane and travel 3,000 miles to do ministry, but we won't go across the street and speak to someone who doesn't look like us. I know i got to wrap it up, but don't do anything crazy. When you're under pressure and you feel like a failure, don't, don't make bad decisions. Stupid won't fix stupid. They made a movie called Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> a motorist was driving his car past the mental hospital when he got a flat tire, and he goes out to change the tire, but he sees that one of the patients is walking to the gate. <laughs> he gets nervous, so he's trying to hurry up and change the tire on the car. He doesn't know what this guy's going to say or do. So he jacks the, the car up and he takes the wheel off and he puts the lug nuts into the hubcap. And in his haste, he steps on the hubcap and all the lug nuts spill out of the hubcap and they go down the sewer drain. And he's kind of, kind of standing there like, oh gosh, what do I do now? The mental patient said to him, he says, why don't you do this, buddy? He says, take one lug nut off of all the other three tires and then put it on this tire. And the guy looked at this guy and put it on and says, man, he says, that's brilliant. He says, what is somebody like you doing in a mental asylum? He said, I'm here because I'm crazy, not because I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm going to let that soak in for about a minute. <laughs> There's a difference between being crazy and being stupid. Albert Einstein said the difference between stupidity and genius is that genius has its limits. Stupidity doesn't. Never give up. Keep fighting that good fight. In the recent Summer Games of 2012, Kim Rhodes, some of you may know her, won the gold medal in skeet shooting, making her the first American to win five Olympic medals in five consecutive Olympic Games. That's a span of 20 years. 
But that's not our only distinction. In, in 2012 games, she hit 99 of 100 skeet in a, a, setting a new Olympic record for that event. Also, her first medal was in 1996, in 1996, making her the youngest female gold medalist in Olympic shooting. How does someone like her distinguish themselves from the rest of the crowd? In an interview with the New York Times, Roe firmly answered this question of how. She says she shoots anywhere from 500 to 1,000 rounds every day of the week, every day of the year. That's a shotgun, y'all. I mean, a drive-by is one thing, but excuse me, I mean a, 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 a rabbit hunt. A pheasant hunt is one thing, but 500 to 1,000 rounds per day, every day. That, let me do the math for you. That's 3,000, excuse me, 3 million plus shots with a shotgun over the span of her Olympic career. 3 million, that equates to 600,000 rounds per medal. But my question was, I wonder how many times she missed before she was able to hit 99 out of 100. You gotta keep shooting. You got to keep going at it. Then remember that you're going to have opposition, not only externally, but internally. The Jews ask him, is it lawful to carry your bed on the Sabbath? There's people around you going to say, you can't do this. What do you think you're doing? Voices will cry out from the externals as well as from the internal. That's the loudest voice. Fear will seem to dominate you at times. Step out and trust God. Find fruit in your failure and overcome. Don't let the voice of criticism, doubt, jealousy, fear, discouragement. Don't let them cause you to turn around and go back. Learn to trust God and finally, always remember God loves you. Always remember he loves you. Always remember he loves you. Sometimes when you can't even figure out where you're supposed to be, always remember that God loves you. I'm reminded of God's love every time I go past a Krispy Kreme donut shop. You say what you want to say, but I believe God created Krispy Kreme donuts. When I go back and I look at the history of the donut, <clears throat> yes, I am a scholar on donuts. Back in the 1800s, I believe, and over in Europe, the Danes, they created, invented the donut, and so they would take this batter, roll it out, and it didn't have the hole like we know it now, it was solid, and then they would fry it. But there was a huge problem, is that when they would fry the donut, it wouldn't cook in the center. If they tried to cook, wait until it cooked in the center, then the perimeter would get too hard. So by the time the early 1900s when the donut came to the United States, there's a lady here, who decided that she was going to cut the hole out of the donut so that it would cook more evenly. And Krispy Kreme got a hole to the hole in the donut, and they're making money off of it. <laughs> you know what I realized? That the same stuff that's in the donut hole is the same ingredients that's in the donut. You know what I realized? It's that this donut is complete. This is what people like. It looks good. It tastes good. This is what people go after. But I realize God not only likes donuts, people who were raised in church, gave their life to Christ at a very young age, people who attend Bible college and seminary and doing a great work for the Lord in the mission field and in the pulpit and, and in classrooms. But you know, God loved donut hoes too. This is that half-cooked stuff that nobody knows what to do with. This is that half-baked stuff. This is that gooey stuff, that unfinished stuff. But God says, look, I love the donut, and I love donut holes. <laughs> because here's what God figured out. He said, I got to look hard in the donut. I have to be able to find some fruit in the failure. And he plucked this out from Calvary's cross through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and he forgave us of our sins. He covered us by his grace. He redeemed us. He sanctified us. He preserved us. He's glorified us. You may be sitting here and you might be a donut, and that's great. I love following donuts because I'm trying to become a donut too. But meanwhile, if you're a donut whole, know that God loves you. And you taste just as good as the finished product. I'm on a diet, but I want to demonstrate that one more time. 
Dr. Aiken, that's why I love preaching. <laughs> Say it with me. God loves, God loves the donut, donut and the donut hole. Father God, we thank you and praise you. Where will we be without you, your grace and your mercy? We want to stand tall. We want to stand victorious. We want to represent you well. Lord, but help us never to hold our heads down in shame and disgust and disgrace. Let us repent of our sins. Let us live the disciplined life. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's all sorts of things that jump out at us and scare us. But help us to realize we don't have to fear evil, whatever it might be, including failure. In Jesus' name, amen.